Well, this is a, a fantastic um, audience, um, standing room, room only, I see. Um, so um, I, I first of all want to thank you very much for, uh, for giving up your lunch times to be here. Um, how many more lunch times we will have is a, is a question that David might answer in a moment. Um, I'm Fiona Harvey. I'm the environment correspondent for The Guardian. Um, I've been writing about uh, climate and the environment since uh, 2004 um, and uh, quite a lot of climate has happened since then. Um, David here, David Wallace Wells, um, has written a book called The Uninhabitable Earth, uh, which is uh, the newest uh, statement uh, of the climate calamity uh, with which we find ourselves confronted. Um, it's a very important book. Uh, it's very well worth reading, and there are signed copies outside, if you haven't read it yet. Um, and I think that those of you who have read it will agree um, that it's a very timely book, considering that the IPCC, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, which is the body of the world's scientists, the leading scientists, the experts, um, have uh, pronounced uh, just last October um, that we are very unlikely uh, to remain within the planetary boundaries, uh, the, the thresholds of safety, uh, if you like, as concerns the climate, um, unless we take drastic action uh, in the next 10 years, 12 years, although how such uh, precision can, uh, can come about, I'm not sure. Um, that's what we'll be discussing. Um, and uh, before uh, we actually get into the discussion, I've been asked to just, just make sure of a few things. Mobile phones, yeah, silent, yes? Good. Um, this event will be uh, filmed, uh, uh, apparently, um, as you can see at the back, um, and it will be uh, live streamed uh, on the internet. Um, so people will be joining us, not just in the room, but virtually, online, um, and the hashtag for that, should you wish to, to, to tweet from here, um, is hash, hash RSA climate. Uh, so you can get involved with the discussion on Twitter that way. Um, so let me introduce David. He is uh, the deputy editor of New York Magazine. Um, he writes about climate change, the future of science, technology, uh, various other uh, issues. But uh, the reason that this book came about, uh, if I'm right, is that in 2017 you wrote uh, a landmark article on, uh, on climate change. Um, it was a cover story in which you looked at the, the different scenarios uh, for global warming. And this was before the IPCC report came out, so you were, uh, you were anticipating that uh, in many ways. Um, and The Uninhabitable Earth is, 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 is the book that, that, that arose from that. Um, what we'll do now is um, I would like you, if you wouldn't mind, to just explain to us um, how you came to write this book um, and what are the key messages of this book and what did you find out when you were researching it and writing it? Absolutely, yeah. Well, first, thank you all for coming. It's great to see everybody here and thank you for... Um, talking with me. It's um, great to be here talking with you about um, this bleak future that we share. Um, I am not an environmentalist. I'm not somebody who has lived in this world my whole life. I'm not somebody who's been committed to the cause of climate change even throughout my adult life. I've always lived in cities, in fact, always lived in New York City, um, and always understood myself to be, you know, like a good liberal person concerned about the future of the planet, but I also felt that my life was sort of being conducted outside of nature, and that in the future many more lives would be um, conducted outside of nature. And so while I was worried about the threat from climate change, I was worried about it in a kind of trivial way um, until relatively recently. That changed about two or three years ago when because of my existing interest in the kind of near future, I started reading a lot of quite alarming scientific papers um, about what was possible with climate change. And as a journalist myself, I watched as those same reports 
and others like them were covered in newspapers and magazines and on television um, in ways that seemed to me quite divergent from the real findings of the research itself. Um, I thought there were basically three big misapprehensions that the public, even the kind of engaged public of which I was a member, had about climate change. The first was that we had been taught to expect that climate change was very, very slow, that it was something that would be unfolding on a time scale of decades at the fastest and probably more like centuries. And so we could imagine, while it might be a problem for our grandchildren and their grandchildren, that we had a lot of time to address the issue. We had a lot of time to grow our way out of the issue and invent technological solutions to the problem. And in fact, more than half of all of the fossil fuel emissions that we've put into the atmosphere in all of human history have been produced in the last 25 years, which means that we've now done more damage to the climate since Al Gore wrote his first book on global warming than in all the millennia before, since the UN established the IPCC, than in all the millennia before, since I say in the book, since the premiere of Seinfeld. This is not an old phenomenon. We're not dealing with the legacy of the Industrial Revolution. We're dealing with the damage that we're doing every day, right now, in real time. And we're seeing that damage on our TV screens finally in the last few years with coverage of extreme weather, natural disasters. I think our, our media culture is just catching up to the fact that climate change is here, but people haven't really begun to appreciate just how much more will be coming, how much faster the problems will be accelerating, and how little time we have to deal with the problem. That was the first big misapprehension I was trying to correct. The second is about the scope of the problem. I had always understood, and I, I, took this as a, I take this as a proxy of most people like me, again, who are engaged in the issue but not deeply, that climate change was mostly an issue of um, Arctic ice and sea level. And while those are really important issues and could completely transform the planet, redrawing the map, um, it's also just one very small part of the problem. And it allowed us to believe, if we were just focused on sea level rise, that if we lived off the coast, we would be safe. In fact, again, with this extreme weather, with the wildfires, with the heat waves we're seeing, we're just now beginning to learn how much bigger the problem is than sea level rise. But again, it's just beginning. There's an enormous amount of really interesting, fascinating, if horrifying research um, that's come out over the last few years about the impact of global warming on agricultural yields. They say that if we end up where we'll be at the end of the century um, without changing course, our grain yields could be half as bountiful as they are today, which means we could have 50% more people on the planet and half as much grain to give them um, on economics. So if we, again, stay on the course that we're on by the end of the century, we'll have seen $600 trillion in damages from climate change, which is more than double all the wealth that exists in the world today. There's horrifying research on the relationship between um, climate and conflict, so that every half degree of warming, you see between 10 and 20% increase in conflict, which means, again, by the end of the century, if we don't change course, we could have more than twice as much war as we have today. And interestingly, the, that research on violence and conflict is not just about interstate violence or intrastate violence. It also is at the level of the individual. So you, you'd see huge spikes in murder, in domestic assault, in rape. Um, just about every level at which violence can be conducted between people goes up when the temperature rises, and we're looking at a future that's going to be a lot hotter, which means we're looking at a future that is likely to be much more violent in every way. Um, and that is just a sign that every aspect of our lives will be touched by climate change. This is one of the big themes of the book, and I think it's extremely important for us to understand. Climate is not something that's happening elsewhere at the coastline or somewhere else. It's not happening to other people, even if it may be hitting other populations more um, intensely than it's hitting the one that you're in. It will touch every life on the planet and transform every aspect of that life down to the decisions we make with our child, you know, having children and family, um, where we live, what kinds of jobs are available, how much economic growth we can come to expect. It's a totalizing, all-encompassing system. And everything we do over the next century will be conducted in the theater of climate change. So I feel very strongly that this century that we're walking into now is um, going to be defined by this issue in the same way that previous centuries were defined, say, by modernity or by financial capitalism. 
we are entering into a new era in which everything about the way that we live will be scrambled by climate change. Almost certainly we will endure in some way, but the society that endures will be transformed and deformed by the forces of climate change. And we haven't yet begun to think about what that will mean for the way we live. So that's the second big thing, the scope. The third thing is the severity. Um, we're now at about 1 or 1.1 degrees of Celsius warming above the pre-industrial average. It's why we're seeing a new rash of extreme weather and natural disaster. Um, but we have much farther to go. For 20 years or so, scientists talked about two degrees of warming as they called it the threshold of catastrophe. And much of the storytelling about climate, the journalism about climate, reflected that idea, treating two degrees as a kind of ceiling because anything north of the threshold of a catastrophe is almost too, you know, too ugly to contemplate. But in fact, through any conventional method of decarbonization, that level of catastrophe, two degrees, is functionally our floor of warming. I don't think there's any way um, through the simple replacement of dirty energy sources with clean energy sources that we stay below two degrees of warming. Um, and I think it's quite likely that we end up significantly north of that. The UN projects that on the course we're on now, as I mentioned before, we'll end up by the end of the century at a little north of four degrees of warming. And at that point, we will, there'll be parts of the world that could be hit with six climate-driven natural disasters at once. The UN believes we could be dealing with as many as one billion climate refugees, which is the number of people to, that today live in North and South America combined. Those people made homeless by climate change. Um, I mentioned the economic impacts, the $600 trillion of climate damages. We could also be living in an economy where the global GDP was 30% lower than it would be without climate change. That's an impact that's twice as deep as the Great Depression, and it would be permanent. These are impacts completely beyond the scope of our imaginability. Like this is um, a whole different world that we're about to be entering into. And in fact, we've already left the world that we all grew up on, which is to say, even at 1.1 degrees where we are now, the planet is now hotter than at any point in all of human history. So at no point in the history of the planet were humans walking around when the Earth was as warm as it is today. That gives you just a sense of how precarious everything that we've built on this planet truly is. You know, I think it's an open question whether humans would have evolved in the first place if the planet had always been this warm. It's certainly, to me, an open question whether we would have developed agriculture and out of agriculture civilization if, um, if the planet had been at 1.1 degrees warmer throughout all that period of time. Because today, where we did develop agriculture in the Middle East, it's already becoming a kind of precarious proposition. The, the yields are much, you know, are falling fast. And if we were trying to engineer that system from scratch, I think we'd be having a much, much harder time. So in a certain sense, we're not talking about the deep history of the planet. We're talking about what life will be like on this new planet that we've made. We are responsible for this climate that we are walking into. And where just how bad it gets, just how much hotter it gets, will always be up to us, which is another important point. I think people often misunderstand. Climate change is not a matter of yes or no. It's not whether it's here or not. It's not about whether we're, you know, whether we've passed a threshold of catastrophe or we're in a hellish doomsday scenario. Every tick upward of temperature makes all of these impacts from agricultural yields to conflict to public health issues to sea level rise. Every tick upward of temperature makes each of those worse. And how far along the path to say 4.3 degrees we get will be determined by what we do. There are these climate feedback loops in the natural system and they will have an impact, but they are, the impact is dwarfed by what humans can do in terms of putting more carbon into the atmosphere or putting less carbon into the atmosphere. And that is, to me, an imperative, an invitation to act aggressively. We, when you look at the worst case scenarios, um, which I don't deal with in the book as much as I did in the original article, but even when you look at the median scenarios, two, three, four degrees, where we're likely to be this century, the, um, the picture of what life would be like is so horrifying, but that, to me, is not an argument for despair or fatalism. It's a reminder of just how powerful we are. Those damages would be damages that we are doing to the planet, and therefore they are also a testament to just how much positive impact we could have if we chose to make that, um, to change that course in that direction. There are a lot of reasons why that 
change, of course, is difficult to imagine. Our politics is full of inertia, our culture, our society. We move very slowly, far too slowly, to really avert um, some of these quite scary outcomes. But nevertheless, it is entirely within our power to avoid. And so as horrible as it sounds to contemplate these futures, they are only, at the moment, hypothetical. And whether we get them and make them real will be our doing. If we get there, we will have been responsible for that suffering. And if we avoid them, we will be responsible for that um, alternative outcome. And that's why I write about the story as being, sounds a little grand, it makes me uncomfortable, I'm an atheist, but it's a kind of a theological story that we're walking through ourselves, living ourselves. We had a quite stable climate 25 years ago. There were things that were going wrong, we would need to take action, but we were not at a point of crisis. Just 25 years later, the planet is in imminent crisis, and 25 years from now, it'll be dramatically worse if we don't take action. The fate of the future of humanity is literally in our hands, and by that I mean not just you know, the people who will live on the planet over the next century, but literally the people who are taking action now, today. We are writing the climate future of the next decade now, and the, ne the decade after, we will be doing the following decade. This is a level of power and a scale of drama that we've never seen before in human history. We are facing the possibility, although it's vanishingly thin, of human extinction at our own hands. And if we avoid that, which I hope and trust that we will, it will be entirely because we have made affirmative choices to avoid it. That story, in addition to being horrifying, distressing, and um, dispiriting, is also, I think, again, empowering in that it reminds us that we are completely in control of our own fate, and we're going through this incredible story together. So that is you know, the sort of broad overview of um, the material in the book, which, which deals with the science of warming and shows just how bleak things could get. But I think its more original contribution is sketching out the impacts beyond the science, not just what global warming is and what it promises, but what it means and what its impact will be on our lives. Again, like on our politics, on our geopolitics, what we expect from capitalism, how we view technology, whether we view it as a force for good, a force for bad, or a mix. We have this inherited idea, basically a Victorian idea, that history marks progress. Whether that continues in the coming decades, I think will be a matter of just how much farther along this path we go and how much warming we avert. Because if we end up at four degrees, I think it will be very hard for us to look back and believe that history really does move forward and human life benefits over time. Um, that's an idea that I grew up with. I'm an American child of the 90s, basically an end of history kid. I really did feel as naive as it sounds now that as time went on, the world would get better. People would get more prosperous. Market forces were not perfect. They created you know, suffering and damage. But over time, I believed that they produced progress. And I think we can protect that promise, but it's imperiled by climate change. And it is certainly possible that by the end of my life or the end of my daughter's life, we'll look back and think of the 21st century as a major setback in terms of human well-being, maybe one that humanity will never be able to recover from. But whether we get there again, it's entirely us to, up to us. And that's, I hope, the lasting message of the book, is there is all this out there to be worried about, to be agitated about, and to be focused on at a political level. But whether we let that happen, or let that happen is a little misleading. Whether we make that happen um, will be our doing. And so we should all be affirmatively choosing to avoid it and do everything we can to make sure that we don't get there. That's a very powerful message. And uh, yeah, that, as you say, um, we have agency here. We choose our fate. What's the most important thing that we can choose to do? What's the, the, the single greatest thing that will help to avert this catastrophe? For me, the answer is very simple. It's just politics. Um, you know, there's a lot of energy these days about individual lifestyle choices, diet, travel. Um, I think these are valuable things for people to do who feel compelled to do them, to make changes in their own life, to live in accordance with their values if they feel um, personally anxious about climate change and f would feel more comfortable living with, within a smaller footprint. That's, that's valuable. But the amount of impact that you can have by eating a few, you know, several fewer hamburgers a year or taking a few, uh, some fewer flights a year, it's really quite trivial compared to the level of impact that policy can have. And that means that the most important thing that anyone can do 
is to vote for leaders who not just understand the crisis and the scale of the crisis, but who make climate change the main priority of their political commitments. Um, I think the more that you know about all of this research, you realize that whatever your political goals are, they are all literally governed by climate change. If you're worried about economic inequality, either within nations or between nations, if you're worried about um, warfare, um, strife, if you're worried about hunger, all of these things are literally governed by climate change. And if we don't address climate change, we won't be able to address any of these other issues. So with a vote, with organizing, rallying, mob mobilizing, we can put pressure on our leaders to make the kinds of policy changes that we need to see changes of the scale we need. Because honestly, no matter how committed the kind of climate conscious liberals of the West are about how they're living their own lives, that impact will be vanishingly small compared to the impact that could be made at a, um, at a policy level. But what policy changes should we be voting for? Well, my feeling is that it's a kind of an all of the above situation. I don't think that there is one silver bullet. I don't think that we should be focused on one silver bullet. I think that um, we should be looking at everything from the banning of new internal combustion engines, which I think will probably be happening over the next decade, um, the total electrification of our car fleet, the possible force, forcing by legislate, legislation, um, the electrification of our airplane fleet, which is a little farther off. I think there's enormous amount of policy that can be directed at our agriculture, which is an underappreciated driver of climate change. It, globally, I think it accounts for about 40% of global carbon emissions. Um, and to return to the meat for a second, there are studies that show that you know if you feed cattle seaweed, that their methane emissions, which is the only reason that they are a carbon problem, will fall by 95, maybe even 99%. So if we made farmers feed their cattle seaweed, we could entirely eliminate the problem of methane released from cows. And there are- Would the cows be happy about that? Well, they, in, the, in the trials, they eat it. I've never, I don't know how the meat tastes, but, um, or, but to, to, you know, um, or to, invest, to have policy that invests dramatically in lab-grown meat so that we're not actually reliant on animals and um, past, pasture animals especially to be producing our protein. Um, there are solutions like that all across, across the spectrum. Many of them feel partial and they are partial, but that's why we need a directed global response. It's not like, um, we can say, well, if we just introduce this one bit of um, policy change, it will transform everything. I'm skeptical in particular of um, the carbon tax, carbon pricing, which on the, on the right, on the political right, is often talked about as a single cure-all because it prices in the cost of carbon emissions into everything you do. But my understanding of how, those, how that carbon pricing has worked wherever it's been instituted is that the prices need to be so high to have any impact that they're effectively a ban. And um, my instinct is that it might just be more efficient to just ban things, like for instance, new internal combustion engines. But there's also a limit to what um, a polity like the UK or the US can do. It's a globe, this is a global problem, and I think it's really important to understand um, that the future will be written globally, which is to say almost entirely by China and the developing world. So China is now responsible for about a quarter of all greenhouse gas emissions. Um, and that number would be higher if you counted all of the infrastructure work that they're doing throughout Africa and Asia as part of their Belt and Road Initiative. Um, and going forward, as they get richer, as their middle class develops and develops a taste for beef and air travel, which they will, um, the, the, imprint, the global footprint of China is only going to grow. Um, the rest of the developing world is following the same trajectory and um, are facing the same dilemmas as China. Now, I'm someone who applauds all of that growth. I think it's fantastic that over the last 25, 30 years, especially in China, but also elsewhere in the developing world, you've seen huge gains in um, you know, pulling people out of poverty, um, increases, you know, decreases in infant mortality, whole new education levels being attained. We've really seen the arrival of a true global middle class. And while we haven't seen the end of global poverty, we can, we've pulled it into sight but that development to this point has been almost entirely produced by the burning of fossil fuels, by industrialization. And the cost of that is the climate change that we now face. Thankfully, finally, um, it's now also the case that 
green energy and renewable energy is in many parts of the world at least competitive and often um, cheaper than dirty energy, which means we can finally say to countries like China, um, you know, you don't have to forego economic growth, you don't have to forego this kind of stable global middle classness in order to save the planet for the rest of us. You can just take a slightly different path and make sure that that development continues in a more renewable, responsible way. Um, and not to say that we're in a position to tell, that, tell China anything, but um, I think from the rhetoric of the last few years that Xi Jinping in particular has put out into the world on climate, they are very focused on this issue too. Um, there are a lot of ways in which China's behaving quite poorly on climate, but there are other ways in which they've made really promising progress. And I think as a nation that sees itself as coming into power as a new empire, they do want to preside over a world that is not on fire, that still has quite um, pervasive prosperity. And they're probably gonna be in a position to um, secure that future for themselves. Um, and in a weird, perverse way, as a Westerner who believes in Western political values, um, I'm hopeful that the kind of Chinese quasi-authoritarian model will be um, actually more effective in, um, I know that's alarming. Um, the, in, uh, I mean, come on. Yeah. Do you want to not have a vote? No, of course I do. But, um, so I, it's fine for those other people? Well, fine I for those other people to not have a vote. I would love to. I would love to. Fine for you. I would love to see China develop and liberalize its um, its political institutions. But I also think that um, waiting for that to happen is going to mean that um, action on climate change comes much too slow. Um, and I'm, in the meantime, heartened that those people who are in positions of authoritarian power are mindful of the climate threat, as opposed to the alternative where they would be dismissive of it. Um, are you aware of how patronizing that sounds? It, what, how do you mean? Because what you're suggesting is that uh, totalitarian states uh, might actually be doing better on the climate because they are totalitarian states. Well, it's, but you have the advantage of living in a Western liberal democracy. Yeah, I think, well, I think there are several different issues at play. Obviously, there's the sort of political issue and what kind of country you want to live in and what kind of country is um, respectful of the human rights and dignity of its, of its citizens. And in many ways, obviously, China is um, doing horribly on that score. In fact, they've dramatically expanded their surveillance powers. They have all these Uyghurs in concentration camps, which is you know, a horrible tragedy. Um, and those are all worthwhile political causes, of course. I would prefer a world in which that was not the case. Um, but thinking exclusively about climate, um, I also think that literally how China behaves in the next 10 years or 15 years is going to have an enormous impact, the, I would say the determinative impact on the climate future of the planet. And I don't see a plausible near-term scenario in which China does liberalize, which is quite different than I would have said 10 years ago or 15 years ago. I mean, as I said a minute ago, um, I'm, you know, this sort of end of history child, in, in, you know, American end of history child. I, I believe that, you know, globalization and market forces were going to bring about liberalization um, in an erratic but reliable way. And while I thought 10 years ago that it may be the case that China would surpass the U.S. as a kind of imperial power, I also expected that that um, progress would mean a China that looked a lot more like the West, that looked much more liberal and open, because that was the kind of intuitive picture I had of how progress happens. Um, they've shown, in fact, the opposite impulse over the last 10 years. They've, um, they opened up for a while, and then they've closed down, and they've actually become much more, you know, um, much more terrible towards their own citizens over the last decade. And I certainly don't applaud that. I'm not rooting for an authoritarian to like stand astride the world and fix the problem for us. But I look at the world as it is, and I say we have 10 or 15, 20 years to really aggressively deal with this problem. We better deal with it with the countries we have and the leaders we have, rather than, you know, um, rather than waiting until it's too late. The leaders we have show very little inclination to actually deal with this problem. Are you talking about Xi Jinping, or are you talking about more? Well, I mean, um, you know, you, you, your, your own president shows yeah. very little inclination. Yeah. And yet, you know, and yet people voted for him. So where does the problem lie there? Um, well, I think that um, I think that the problem lies in our politics, and we should do what we can to fix them. Um, do you my, think that climate change has become a left-right issue? I actually think in the, the example of the U.S., which is the one that I know best, um, it's surprisingly not. Um, over the last 20 years or so, in America in particular, 
we've seen a real hardening of partisan identities so much that just about every piece of someone's worldview is filtered through a partisan ideological prism. So it's the case that if you look at polling um, from the 90s about whether O.J. Simpson was guilty or innocent, there was no partisan split. Democrats and Republicans, had, when you controlled for race, had the same opinion of that. That kind of um, diversity of opinion is completely impossible to imagine today, so much so that there's now an enormous partisan split on questions as sort of apolitical as whether 12 years a slave deserved an Oscar. And that's, that governs all of American culture, that we live in an incredibly partisan environment where what TV shows you watch and what food you eat is sort of filtered through this partisan prism. And yet, um, new polls show that 73% of Americans believe that global warming is real. 70% of them are concerned about it. So you can see that this is actually, that global warming is actually something that defies the easy partisan split, that um, simplistic partisan split. Um, it hasn't yet made itself, that change hasn't yet made itself known within the Republican Party and its leaders. Um, and I think the problem is really with that party rather than with those voters. Although those voters would change that party if they were voting um, at, with climate as a top priority rather than as a you know, fourth, fifth, sixth order political priority. But I do think those numbers are moving actually quite rapidly. Um, those of us who have been sitting with climate change, thinking about climate change for a while, often feel like progress is quite slow, and it, it's true, it's, it's far too slow, but it's also the case that, um, again, those numbers, 73% who, who believe climate change is real in the US, 70% who believe it's concerning, those numbers have grown 20% just in the last three years, and um, they've grown 8% just since March of this year. So those are quite dramatic movements, and you see it reflected in a lot of the grassroots activity um, all around the world. I mean, I would say in the US, um, we've had you know this Green New Deal activity in, in Congress, which is a major watershed um, for climate politics. In the, U in the UK, we've had Extinction Rebellion. We have the climate strike on the continent. You can see a real sea change in the way that people are thinking about climate. I don't think it has yet transformed our politics sufficiently, but I'm hopeful that we're beginning to see that. I'm also worried that we're not going to see it fast enough. And what about, what about business? Because at the end of the day, someone is making money from this. Um, what do you think can be done about the fact that, well, we have a, an economy that is built on fossil fuels, um, and, and changing that is going to be, uh, well, it's going to have an awful lot of losers. Well, it'll have some losers, but most of them are quite well off already. Um, I would say, you know, if, um, so there are estimates for how high the fossil, how much um, the fossil fuel industry is subsidized globally that are as high as $5 trillion a year. Um, we should not be subsidizing it at all. That's a very easy solution. I mean, it's complicated because it's, those subsidies are conducted in many countries in many different ways, but um, I think there's basically no moral excuse for continuing to subsidize those businesses. And if we redirected that money into um, research and development into green energy, and in particular, um, you know, I think personally negative emissions technologies which can suck carbon out of the air, um, we'd actually be very quickly in um, in a much better position. So just to talk a little bit about that for a second, um, generally speaking, negative emissions, this is any method that takes carbon out of the atmosphere. You can do that with the way that you do agriculture. You can do that by um, sort of consciously what's called reforesting or afforesting. So you're planting more trees which suck carbon out of the atmosphere and produce oxygen. Um, but there are also ways to do it technologically, um, industrially. and these are not technologies that have been tested at scale, but they do work um, in sort of laboratory environments. There was a major breakthrough last year in the US where it was found that you could uh, take carbon out of the air at a cost of about $100 a ton. That would mean that we could completely neutralize all greenhouse gas emissions all around the world at a cost of about $3 trillion a year. So if you keep in mind that we're subsidizing the fossil fuel business $5 trillion a year, it would be conceivably possible to just redirect those subsidies and immediately eliminate the entire problem of climate change. Um, that would mean that there were, we could continue, in theory, the economic activity that we're doing right now and yet add no new carbon to the atmosphere going forward, which would be especially appealing because it would buy us more time. If we, stay, if we were able to stay at the carbon concentration where we are now, 410, 411, 412, depending on the month, parts per million, um, 
that's not a good place to be. But if we have 50 years to de decarbonize rather than 12 years to decarbonize, it's much more likely that we get there. And that's one reason why I think negative emissions technologies are a promising part of the solution. Although I don't think it's realistic to deploy them at the global scale I just mentioned, I just said that to say, as a point of comparison, we have these subsidies, we can turn them into investments, and that would make an enormous, enormous difference. Um, on the more pulled back perspective of the economic effects generally, I think that the research there is really exciting um, in that it used to be the case that conventional wisdom among economists was that action on climate would be very expensive, that it would mean foregoing some economic growth in the near term, probably even in the medium term, and we would have to be doing it out of a kind of moral concern rather than out of economic self-interest. And unfortunately, um, some would say fortunately, but I would say probably unfortunately, most of our leaders are motivated by economic self-interest in the sense of wanting their countries to develop and grow more quickly. Um, but all of the recent research from the economics of climate change suggests the opposite logic is true. It's not that there's an economic trade-off, it's that there are enormous economic benefits um, to In reap. In what kind of time period? A big study uh, from last year said that by 2030, global, rapid global decarbonization could add $26 trillion to the economy. So that's in 10 years. So, yeah. So that's not an immediate benefit. Well, it's, I mean, it's... So there's an immediate cost. There is some immediate cost, but and I mean, it's... A medium to long-term benefit. Yeah, I mean, I don't, I don't think most economic policymakers think of 10 years as that, as a long-term, but maybe a medium-term. But in any event, it's a few... two parliamentary cycles in this country. Yeah. Um, well, that makes it seem relatively short. Um, to me. Um, but I think that, you know, it, it was the case that um, many policymakers were in a certain way imprisoned by that thinking for a long time because they, they felt, as many of us did, who sort of received that conventional wisdom more, um, you know, just sort of through the atmosphere, um, that we could wait and watch for more growth and wait for more technological progress and solve the problem later. But the, the, the clear logic is towards acting quickly now. And I think that's even more true in certain parts of the world than others. But it does have an immediate cost. Some immediate cost, but so does any public action. I mean, um, so does investing in the stock market. That doesn't mean we shouldn't do it. If the payoffs are big enough, um, it, you, don't, you, don't, you don't think of that investment as a cost. You think of it as an investment. And I think the economic um, conventional wisdom is now that action on climate would be an investment rather than a cost. I think that's a major sea change. And I think it will change the way that our policymakers view the issue personally. Okay, but we've always known that it, it, it's an investment. Well, I'm not so sure that that's the case. I think that 20 years ago, people would have thought, I mean, the, the, the measure of the economic impacts of climate change 20 years ago, the Stern report was the impacts were trivial compared to the impacts that we're predicting now. So the um, conventional economic wisdom was that while climate change could be damaging in all these humanitarian ways, that it would not be all that measurably impactful on our say, our global GDP, and that now seems to be, a, you know, dramatically different conventional wisdom, so much so, like I said before, we now expect that by the end of the century, if we don't take action, global GDP will be 30% lower than it would be otherwise. That is many categories more intense an impact than um, any economist, even a, a lefty environmental economist, was predicting 20 years ago. And, I, I, yeah, so while there were cases being made by advocates that, uh, investment was necessary, I don't think that they had the support of the kind of centrist business class, which, as unfortunate as it may be to say, could be essential to real dramatic action. There is an inherent absurdity in uh, trying to put a cost on the death of the planet. So, uh, yeah, I mean, I, I would just say that's one of the perverse things about these statistics. Um, they dramatically overstate the impact on the wealthy countries of the world and dramatically underestimate the impact on the poor countries of the world because flooded real estate in Bangladesh is, uh, much, shows up much more trivially in our global GDP than flooded real estate in Miami Beach. Um, but even so, the studies say that measuring in dollars and cents that India is, is particularly going to be um, pummeled at a level beyond anything imaginable, um, much higher than any of the other countries of the world. So um, that's another thing to keep in mind, that we live in a world that is um, rife with inequality and suffers as a result, and climate change will unfold along that um, axis too, that the suffering will be distributed unequally and uh, much more heavily on the poor, which is an incredible tragedy and something that we as people who 
live and work mostly in the wealthy West should certainly keep in mind. Absolutely. Um, I'm going to open up to the, the floor now for questions because uh, I'm sure we, well, we do have several. I think we have a roving microphone, if not more than one. Hello. Um, I'm going to take gentlemen in the front row first. We've got a, a microphone here and then behind you and then you, sir, and then I'll come to this side. So many thanks for your talk. And I'm looking forward to getting your audio version of the book in a six days' time when it's available. You gave an encouraging message when you said it might be possible to redirect some of the subsidies to the fossil fuel industry, which you measured as $5 trillion a year. And if we could use $3 trillion a year we could, on existing technology, we could take uh, greenhouse gases out of the atmosphere. But then you said, well, this wasn't uh, really feasible on a global level. So I wonder why not? What's going to stop that from happening? Surely it's enough for a group of uh, a country or a region to start doing that, and then others will uh, take inspiration from it and see that it works. Thank you. Yeah, I'm, I'm hopeful that um, we do invest in um, negative emissions technologies globally. Um, I do think that they're going to be a part of the solution, although I don't think they're the whole part of the solution. The reason I don't think that it's all that feasible at a global scale is, um, I mean, to start with, it's, it would still be more expensive to put carbon, to suck carbon out of the atmosphere than to put it into the atmosphere in the first place. So that money would actually be better spent just invested in decarbonization than it would in terms of negative emissions. The people who work on this um, science most intensely feel the real benefit there is that um, there are parts of our economy and our agriculture which are relatively easy to decarbonize and others that are not. So for instance, I mentioned the possibility of electric planes earlier. We're very far from having electric planes, um, but we assume that in the future, if we want to have a world like the world that we have now, people will still want to fly. So the question is, how can we continue to have air travel <laughs> while reducing the carbon footprint of those planes? You can theoretically use the, the, main, the, the person who's done the, the most exciting research in carbon capture, this guy David Keith at Harvard, is actually doing it to produce carbon neutral fuel, which could theoretically be used in, a, um, in an in engine like a jet engine, um, so we could have air travel that was carbon neutral. Um, and there are other sectors of the economy, heavy industry in particular, um, where we won't be able to decarbonize all that quickly. The energy sector is one where we're making a lot of progress and um, almost certainly won't need this kind of exceptional technology because, in part because the market forces are what they are now. Um, prices are, it's cheaper to invest in new wind, new solar than it is to invest in new dirty energy in most parts of the world. And those prices are still falling. So the logic there will only get more, you know, stronger. But there are parts of the, um, parts of our carbon footprint that are going to be more difficult to eliminate. And I think that's where the negative emissions um, technology will most come into play. But yeah, I mean, on the subsidy point, that's not my research. There's some other, you know, but $5 trillion a year, that's a lot of money to play with, with R&D. It's a lot of money to play with in terms of investing in infrastructure. Um, and it would be great if we spent it that way rather than wasting it um, by burning ourselves up. And just to check, where, where does that figure come from, the, the, the subsidies? Um, I, I don't remember the, the author of the paper, but um, I mean, it's in the book. It's a footnote in the book. <laughs> I mean, there have been a number of it's studies. It's in a footnote on page 63. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, that's fine. Um, we had a question a, a couple of rows back, didn't we? David, thank Hello. you. Um, that's really, you know, really good to hear your thoughts and to you know, see you talk about it in the flesh. Um, I think it's really interesting the, 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 the aspect of other countries growing and developing wealth and stuff, and that you know, other countries want to grow. Yeah? And I think, and you can't stop them from doing that. And I think that what that presents is that, you know. Perhaps, I think all of us here probably want to move um, to, to solving climate change, but actually I think well, the question I want to ask you is, do you not think we should be instead, as, as countries, be looking at resilience to climate change, adaption to climate change, and trying to cope with a world that's hotter uh, and colder, um, in part, and, and instead of trying to solve this problem? Um, because I, I don't think you're going to do it. You know? I, I, wish, I wish we could, but I don't think we will. My basic answer to that is anytime anybody asks me a question that uses the word instead, I say it's like it's really an all of the above situation. I, I think that we should be investing in adaptation and mitigation for sure. I think especially in certain parts of the world that are already being really hit quite hard. Um, if we want to preserve those places as habitable environments, as um, stable communities, we will need to invest very dramatically in resilience. 
Um, now the question is, who will pay for that? Um, if you think about Bangladesh, saving a lot of southern Bangladesh will involve, would involve building a seawall hundreds of miles long. That is an infrastructure problem that is enormously expensive. It's beyond the capacity of the nation of Bangladesh to pay for. Um, and I think one of the vectors of our emerging geopolitics will be um, what our collective responsibility is to those people and to those nations, whether nations like the US and the UK and China um, end up paying a kind of climate reparations to those, those uh, nations, those communities that are really suffering to support their um, development of that kind of infrastructure, whether they make those kinds of accommodations through refugee resettlement programs, that is another way of spending. Um, but there's also, um, on the sort of solution side, um, you know, you can imagine investment that produces new technology in the wealthier parts of the world then being um, essentially handed over to less wealthy parts of the world at no cost um, with no, you know, enforcement of IP, that kind of thing, so that um, whatever new, tech, new green technology we're developing, say, in the United States, could be then um, used, licensed for free in, say, India and Bangladesh and China. Um, and that's another way that we might be able to help those people who are um, likely to be hit hardest, although, again, it would be solving the global problem rather than the immediate um, threat of, say, flooding, river flooding, a sea level rise, and direct heat. Um, but, you know, in general, yeah, I think... Um, the question of who bears responsibility and how we adapt, um, what degree of investment we make in mitigation versus um, green energy. These are all open questions. I don't quite know or feel qualified myself to make firm pronouncements or predictions, but I do think that collectively, this suite of dilemmas will be shaping the way that we relate to one another as nations and as individuals in the decades ahead in a way that we don't, really don't appreciate now. The, you know, so much of the legal framework of the international system of the late 20th century was forged around human rights and in the aftermath of World War II, what it meant to try to build a prosperous, stable, um, peaceful planet. Those are values that are likely to continue to be a part of the way we think about the interactions between nations, of course, but I think that climate change will become a bigger and bigger part of that conversation such that um, trade deals, peace treaties are um, include climate elements. Um, we may even have some legal framework emerging that involves enforcement mechanisms for violating your carbon budgets and what that means is again an open question but um, I think that all of these things will be um, dominated by the questions raised by climate change in ways that we haven't really begun to contemplate or take seriously and the question of how we save the people who, who will be hit hardest is one of the most pressing ones. I don't think we have an answer to that, but I do know we'll be asking that question a lot more in the coming decades. Um, we had a question, uh, I'll come to you in, in, in a bit, but um, we had a question at the back here, uh, and then one here, and then I'm gonna to come to this side of the room. Thank you, Danica Please. McCarthy, Climate Media Coalition. Um, I'd like you to address the issue that um, the problem of the media, we seem to have a media that's really dependent on fossil fuel advertising. For example, The Guardian this, on Saturday had one page about the potato wrapper, but 32 pages of long-haul flights, uh, uh, cruises to the Antarctic to see it melting, etc. So we have a, a model of media that is actually dependent on the fossil fuel industry. So how can we possibly create the social and political permission that you're saying we must in, uh, address when the media is telling us the opposite and brainwashing us saying that high-carbon lifestyles are okay when they aren't? That's the challenge we face. Murdoch has just toppled the Prime Minister in Australia for daring to do something on climate. Murdoch in with Fox News in America has made it impossible for any Republican to, try to address cl uh, climate change. And, and Murdoch in the United Kingdom is, t is promoting fracking. We've got a real problem, and it's media that's the problem. How do we deal with it? Thank you. Well, one sort of um, glib answer is that um, the business model of media is changing very rapidly and moving away from advertising, actually. Um, so these are problems, that's a kind of legacy problem. Print advertising is disappearing very rapidly. I know this as a person who works in print media. Um, and many, at least in the US, many of the um, org media organizations that are enduring and thriving are those that are moving to subscription models. And those are much more responsive to the needs and interests of their readers, much less to the interests of the advertisers. I don't mean to diminish the, um, the problem that you describe, I think it is a very real problem. Um, I think it's essentially consistent with 
um, many of the features of our world beyond media. That is to say that we all benefit from carbon, all of us living in the modern world, and we are reluctant to admit that and to take action to deal with it. I think that um, it would be imp it's important for media to be more forthright about the problems that we face. That's one of the things that I've been trying to do personally, but also by showing my colleagues and rivals and at other outlets um, just how much of an audience there is for writing about climate, which had been considered in the past a kind of traffic kryptonite. Um, but I also think that um, we have to face those challenges in our own life, um, not just in our newspapers, which is to say, um, if we know climate change is real and is concerning, that we should be pushing for um, action to establish a kind of environment of choice such that what media we consume, but also how we get our electricity, how we travel, how we eat, all of these choices we make are conducted in a broader environment in which um, even the worst decision is still, relatively speaking, climate responsible. We now live in a world because of the policy that we have, because of the politics we have, where the worst choices we can make are quite damaging to the environment. And I think that the solution, media is a huge problem, our storytelling is a huge problem, and I'm trying to do what I can to change that. Um, but I think that the, the solution is really politics and media is just um, you know, one obstacle on the path to political, um, to political progress. And I think that um, you know, the social media era we live in, um, among many problems it's brought into being, means that activism and organization is much more possible outside um, establishment institutions like the papers you mentioned. And there can be much more dramatic grassroots mobilization than there would have been, than there could have, could have been possible uh, not so long ago. So I'm hopeful about that too. I had no idea before I came here that I was such a huge problem. Yeah. Um, we, had, uh, we had one more here, I think, didn't we, behind you? Oh, no, no, sorry, I did, sorry. Uh, with your question and then one behind you, and then I'm going to come to this side of the room. Hi. Uh, so you mentioned uh, about policymakers and making leaders who would actually drive you know, towards making policies which would be more towards a greener environment. But being this generation, even in this room, I see, like, you know, I do not see much people from my generation. Uh, what, I mean, this generation needs to know that we have to be aware because we are the people who are putting in a lot into creating so much. Uh, if you look at the fashion world, if you look at the social media, we are creating the future for ourselves. So how do you think the generation like for, from my generation who doesn't have that, you know, that power of creating or stepping into politics immediately, but we are making changes in every day, we are making decisions every day for ourselves. How can we as a generation or how can people from my generation help in creating or help the global warming or, you know, be the change for tomorrow? Well, um, my, before you uh, answer that, David, because um, I'm just conscious that I do need to get to this side of the room, and there was a question behind you as well. So if we could take the question behind you as well, we'll take two at once. Hello? Yeah. Uh, yeah, so my question is regarding consumerism and production. Uh, so I think, like, uh, same like her, uh, we belong to this generation. We are really consumed about new products coming into market every day. And um, in terms of production as well, like, there are so many new products coming into market every day, using up so much of natural resources, uh, which is directly related to climate change. Uh, so I would wa like to know what are your thoughts regarding uh, this scenario. Thank you. Um, well, let's take the first question first. Um, personally, I'm really excited, moved, exhilarated um, by the level of political commitment among the young. Um, I mean, when I look at the polls in the US, um, I see huge margins of support and intensity of support for climate change that is impossible to imagine among the, the older generation. I mean, really, if you look at how those questions track over, over the age groups, it's like, you know, Gen Z is like 90% really freaked out about climate and really wants aggressive action. And then all the way to the silent generation like does not care at all. And it tracks pretty closely with how old you are. The younger you are, the more you care, which makes sense. You'll be around to see more of it. And when I look at you know, the activism of Greta Thunberg and the, the climate strike movement, I see the same thing that people who are not even old enough to vote are making their voices heard very aggressively. And I take heart from that. It's true that if you're in your 20s, it's not all that likely that you could become immediately 
a political leader. Um, although it's not impossible, the most exciting climate leader in the US is Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, who's 29, um, and she is leading the transformation of American politics on this issue herself. But yeah, most people aren't gonna be leaders, and that's why I say voting is, for you, for everybody else, the most important thing to do, along with um, mobilizing and organizing in ways outside of the voting process that nevertheless puts pressure on our leaders. But it's, I think it's an unfortunate thing for both of our polities, for both the US and the UK, that so many of our leaders are so old, and in the US in particular, like the Senate, so many of the senators are like 75 or older, and a president is that old, it's just, it's, I think it's not good. Um, but I also think that you can change those people's perspective um, by applying pressure to them. They all want to stay in power and they want to have the support of their constituents and all of those levers are still possible. There's the kind of countervailing force of, climate, of oil money, especially in the US. But I think that um, voting power can outdo that. Um, and so I think, you know, in general, my message to everybody, but especially the young, is just don't forget to vote. I mean, in the US, you know, young people not voting is really a huge problem. Um, and making them feel, making young people feel the intensity of their concern about climate as an immediate imperative to vote and to organize, I think is the most important thing. Um, on the question of on consumer, consumerism, yeah, I mean, my, my feeling about this is that there are many toxic elements to our consumer culture that go beyond the climate footprint, but climate is certainly one way in which it's felt. Um, I think actually the most corrosive part of that culture is that it teaches us that we make our mark politically by what we buy and what we eat and what we wear. And it's a sort of distraction from the real political action that we need. Um, so if you think that like, yeah, what brand of t-shirt you wear is the most important thing that you can do for the climate, you're deeply misguided. Um, and you can wear any shirt. I mean, really like, yeah, there's some shirts that are gonna be better than others in terms of carbon footprint. But really from my perspective, if you're voting the right way and supporting the right po politicians, you can wear whatever, vote, whatever shirt you want. That is an, you know, effectively a trivial, um, has a trivial impact compared to the political impact. And I think there's a great, um, it's one of the great cons of um, market neoliberalism that it teaches us to turn away from political action and instead channel those impulses towards buying choices, which are essentially um, all supportive of the status quo rather than radical change. Some buying choices are important though, aren't they? Um, <laughs> we've got some, uh, some questions here. Um, I, I apologize for getting to this side of the room a little bit late, but to be fair, the other side did have more hands up. Um, so uh, uh, the, the gentleman here has had his hand up for ages, so I'm going to take him first and then we'll come along this row. We hear um, a, a lot of talk about climate warming. What we don't hear much about is climate dimming. Every time we burn fossil fuels, every time we drive our car, every time we light a bonfire, every time we strike a match even, particles are are uh, 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 going up into the upper atmosphere where they act as an umbrella and reduce the sun's incidence. So if tomorrow we say we're never going to drive our cars again, we're never going to heat our homes, what we do is reduce global dimming, uh, which again in itself will increase global warming. So it's a quandary that we haven't fully addressed. Yeah, I mean, some of those particles fall to the earth as soot, which increases global warming. So it's not a, a straightforward simple, effect. No. Uh, we had a, a, a question here, and the, and, and the lady here. Oh, there we go. There you go. Okay, so you talked about the right politicians, but if there are no right politicians, um, what do you see as a way of mobilizing the government or the decision makers in our world to actually start having this mental shift away from capitalism and focusing on the environment do you i mean the idea of extinction rebellion citizens assembly do you see that as a possibility i'm very excited about we, we've got 12 totally. years to save the world so do you think we're going to reform capitalism in that time i hope so <laughs> well i think reform is possible you go the ahead. question of like revolution is maybe a little harder to imagine but um i'm very excited by movements like those i'm especially excited by extinction rebellion because it's grown so fast and shows just how intense those people who are feeling left out of the conversation about climate, um, how intense their feelings are. And I think that there will be very meaningful political impact of that mobilization. Um, it's spread to the US and I think you can see it there too, but um, I do think that grassroots activism 
can make a huge difference. Yeah, and I'm heartened by all the recent activity. And dimming, do you think global dimming is a problem? Yeah, I mean, I think you know, aerosol pollution kills nine million people a year right now, and if we completely eliminated it, it would mean probably a half degree extra of warming, which would mean we'd be right up against the threshold of a catastrophe already. How we deal with that, I don't have an easy answer. It's a kind of a catch-22. I think you're right, it's not a simple problem there. It's you know, com complicated equations, but in general, we're killing ourselves in order to cool the planet. Um, and if we decide to um, save those lives, save those nine million lives every year, which is an amount of death that's bigger than the, the Holocaust, um, then we'll be inflicting more warming on ourselves, and that's quite a terrifying choice to contemplate. Okay. Um, I'm going to take a question here from the gentleman who's been very patient and the gentleman here. We're going to take these very quickly because we, we, we are running out of time, but I'm sure you'll be brief. Thank you very much for your talk, by the way. Uh, I think, actually, maybe you could be part of the, a major problem because she keeps saying the word, we need to do something and we need to do this and we need to make these choices. We, here, most people in this room on this planet, don't own the oil industry or the oil, oil or the war industry which is interlinked with the oil industry. And you keep saying we need to vote. The papers, I mean, the Guardian itself takes, as the gentleman pointed out earlier, takes hundreds of thousands from uh, the oil industry itself. And they're, they're capable and just as guilty for it as well. We need to drop this we business because we don't live in, I'm sorry, yeah, and also uh, the oil companies own our parliament and they pay for our parliaments and politicians to protect them. We don't earn any of that. We, as the lady said here, capitalism needs to be dealt with and completely brought underneath our ownership. Only then can we actually then make the decision to stop all this, because we never voted for a world to be destroyed by the oil industries. No one did that. Thank you very much. It was they who did it. <laughs> I mean, in, in, in front, I think we, we, we need a microphone here. Yes, I, I'm worried about more than, more than that. There are two, two things. We see some lunacy. We see people using an immense amount of, they say it's renewable power, but for driving computers to generate bitcoins. How mad is that? Because the power used turns into heat. Heat continues the heat load in our atmosphere. But it's more, is growth going to be the answer? It's continually been put forward here that growth we're going to solve things, we're going to grow our way out of it. Actually, I think we probably need to try and stop population growth because the more people we have, the more energy we'll use, the more food we'll need, and yet we are already constraining what's happening. How do we go about long-term changing minds to, to reduce the overall population level of this world? So the RSA saves all the uh, huge questions to the end. Um, answer that. Well, um, <laughs> yeah, the, I mean, the Bitcoin story is really har harrowing. We now use more um, energy to produce Bitcoin than is produced by all of the world's solar panels combined, um, which means that just that revolution has completely undone all of the gains from green energy over the last few decades, which is completely har harrowing, horrifying. Um, I... You know, I, to, in answer to the, the first question, um, I have a different perspective than you do. I think that um, it's problematic to retreat from a sense of collective responsibility on this issue. I believe that the oil companies, as you do, have been completely villainous and have done enormous damage to the planet, especially their campaigns of denial and disinformation have been absolutely horrifying. But I... But, you know... The en energy sector is something like 28% of the global carbon emissions footprint. Agriculture is bigger than that. We're not, like, it's not the oil companies who are directing our diets. It's not, well, we all determine it by the way that we behave. I mean, it's, that's, that's why I think that it's damaging to think that um, this problem is the result of um, several few villains, as villainous as the people who have behaved poorly on this issue are. 
I think that we have to understand, I think you would agree, as someone from the left, that we bear a collective responsibility to secure the future of the planet, and that's why I keep talking about we. I don't have any sympathy for the oil companies, but I don't think that means that we should be, um, I think that that means we need to see the problem as a global threat which challenges all of us and which calls us to collective action um, rather than the kind of individual action of like eating better or whatever. Um, I do think we need that, a kind of global policy transformation. I don't think I'm quite as far to the left as you do, but I think it will involve some meaningful reformation of the way that we do business and conduct ourselves vis-a-vis um, -vis markets. Um, but I also think that, you know, to say that we need to, um, you know, reduce the population of the planet or dramatically cut back on um, the, uh, the sort of um, creature comforts of modern life, I actually don't think that the science suggests that that's the case. I think that we can um, have a planet that has 10 or 11 billion people who are living quite well on it if we have a policy architecture that organizes that life in a responsible way. The, the imperative is to make that policy architecture come to be and make sure that it enforces um, all of the choices that we need to make to secure that future. Thank you very much. And I'm afraid that I, I must say, along with planet Earth, that's all we have time for. Um, <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, thank you uh, for your uh, participation. Thank you uh, for uh, coming to, to listen. Uh, it's been an enormously important uh, discussion, and uh, David's book is available outside. There are signed copies. David can't stay with us any longer because uh, he's got to go catch a plane. Yeah. Um, so um, uh, I'll invite you to, uh, to thank him. Thank you. Thank you.